Welcome to video two for week seven. In this video, I'm gonna talk about transformations represented by matrices acting on the objects that we've developed early in the course. So we spent a lot of time in this course developing the notion of linear subspaces and offset linear subspaces, affine subspaces, these flat, infinitely extended points, lines, planes, hyperplanes, other kinds of flat, infinitely extended objects that exist in Euclidean space. And these are the objects that I said that we're gonna study in this course well, now that we have transformations of space, I want to figure out how these transformations affect these linear and affine subspaces. So if I have a matrix representing transformation and I give you a span or a locus, can we say, where does this span or this locus go? If I have a transformation of two dimensions and I have a line, what does the transformation do to the line? It might spin it around, it might flip it somewhere, it might do all sorts of things. It would be nice to have general algebraic machinery that tells us how transformations represented by matrices affect spans and affect loci. That's the goal of this video. Let's review the terminology here first. So if I have a matrix that goes from Rn to Rm, so that's going to be an M by N matrix. Uh, the size, the number of rows, the number of columns. The number of rows is going to be the domain of the target. The number of columns is going to be the domain the, the, where we start. So if I have some affine or linear subspace in the domain, then the matrix can act on this subspace. What I would be asking then for is the image of L, if I wanted to be more specific, I would say the image of L under the matrix M. You have a line, what's the image of that line under the transformation? You have a plane, what's the image of that plane under that transformation? There's one other use of the term image, and this is a little bit confusing. But if I talk about M acting on everything, so what's the image of the entire space of all of our N? I don't necessarily say the image of the entire space. We just talk about this as the image of the transformation. And that's, that's a little bit annoying terminology because this is the image of a thing that we're transforming. This is the image of the transformation itself, but that is the standard terminology. So if I say, what's the image of M? I mean, where does M send the entire space? This is the same as asking for the range in the language of calculus. What are all the possible outputs? So the image of a transformation are, is the set of all possible outputs of that transformation. Well, let's start with then with spans. So I have this transformation going from Rn to Rm. So this is an M by N matrix. The matrix action is linear. That was the whole point. Matrices perfectly encoded linear transformations. But this is really, really good because spans are defined by linear operations. So if I have a span of some number of vectors v1 up to vk, then everything in the span can be written as a linear combination of these vectors. So some constant times v1 plus some constant times v2 all the way up to plus some constant times vk. But the action is linear. So this action can be split up over these additions and these scalars, whatever these scalars are, can come out. So this action is the same as some multiple of m acting on v1 plus some multiple of m acting on v2 all the way down to some multiple of m acting on vk. So that's now a linear combination of these things. So anything that starts in the span here, any linear combination of the vectors v1 up to vk ends up as a linear combination of the vectors mv1, mv2, up to m v k, and that's the matrix M acting on the vector v1, the matrix M acting on the vector v2, the matrix M acting on the vector v k. And what this establishes is that spans go to spans. And this is really, really lovely. Transformations work very, very well with spans. Where does a span go to? You just take a spanning set, take a basis, figure out where that basis goes to, and you get the span of that new basis. That's where the span is going to go to. Now it's a little bit complicated, but whether or not the dimension is preserved, we'll get into those kind of questions later. But the really, really nice thing is that spans go to spans. And the same thing is true also for offset spans. So I have this transformation, the action is still linear. So an offset span is some span plus some other vector. Well, I know the span goes to the span of the new vectors and this plus the action is linear. So I can just do the action separately and then add them together. So it just goes to another offset span, and the new offset is the image of the old offset. And it might be a different offset. It might not be an offset at all. If, if m sends u to zero, it might now be uh, an actual span to the origin. 
Whatever it is, wherever m sends this u, I get something that looks like an offset span again. The span piece goes to a span piece, the offset goes to an offset, and the addition works before and after the transformation because the transformation is linear. All of this is based on the idea that we're studying in this course, linear transformations, things that work well with addition and scalar multiplication. All right, this works well with spans, this works well with offset spans, what happens with loci? Loci are not described by linear uh, combinations, they're described by linear equations. And we might think, well, that's good, linear equations are formed of linear operations. Unfortunately, they don't transform as nicely. We can't just transform the coefficients of the equation. There's no sort of nice equation goes to equation transformation of loci. It's annoying, but it's just something we have to live with. So if we want to understand a matrix acting on a locus, really the best thing to do is express that locus as an offset span. And that's a thing we already know how to do. We can write the locus as a system. We can solve the system. We can express the system as free parameters. And in a system expressed, a solution expressed as free parameters, we can write that as an offset span. So via the work we've done on systems and how to solve them and how to express their solutions, a locus can always be expressed as an offset span. And then we can calculate the image of that offset span as we did in the previous slide. And this, in general, is the only way to calculate images of loci. You might think, well, planes and hyperplanes are defined by normals. Normal is a vector. Can't we just figure out what the normal goes to? Won't that be the new normal? Unfortunately, that won't be. Normals of planes and hyperplanes may not be preserved under transformations because the fact that something sits orthogonal may change. The transformation may move things, change angles, and things that start out as orthogonal may not end up as orthogonal. So as much as it is tempted to try and transform the equations or transform the normals, none of that works in general. The only way we can transform loci via matrices is actually to go back to expressing them as spans or offset spans.